Welcome to University of Michigan Club of Washington, D.C., U of M Center for Political Studies presentation, Race, Inequality, Policing, and the 2020 Election. My name is David Koss, and it is an honor to introduce Ken Coleman, Professor of Political Science at U of M and Director of the Center for Political Studies. Ken. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I'm Ken Coleman. I'm director of the Center for Political Studies at the university. Uh, we're part of the Institute for Social Research, uh, ISR. Uh, both CPS and ISR are well known across the world for innovation and credibility in the social sciences. We specialize in rigorous collection analysis and archiving of data relevant to many disciplines in the social sciences. In the social sciences, public health, medicine, information and data sciences, and human technology intersections. I'm delighted to have our three speakers this evening. They're all distinguished for the care in the work that they do, for their attention both to the details of data about human behavior, but also the broader contexts where events of great importance take place. Each this evening will speak for approximately 15 minutes, and then after all have spoken, we will take questions and they can answer uh, questions as best um, that I can moderate those. Uh, our first speaker will be Vincent Hutchings. Uh, he's a research professor in our center. He is a diverse, the diversity and social transformation professor. He's the Haynes Walton Jr. Professor of Political Science and Afro-American and African Studies. He was formerly the director of the American National Election Studies and he is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Our second speaker will be Shay Streeter. She is a postdoc in our center. She's currently a president's postdoctoral fellow at U of M and she will join the U of M faculty in fall 2021 as an assistant professor of political science. She arrived at U of M after getting her PhD at Stanford. Our third speaker will be Christian Davenport. He's a faculty associate in our center. He's a professor of political science. He is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Our speakers will each um, talk about our topic today, which as you know, is about race policing and the 2020 elections. I'll now turn it over to Vince, uh, who will lead us off. Thanks for the introduction there, Ken. I'm gonna try to share my screen here and hopefully there are no technical issues. Um, so you can see the title, uh, assuming everything's working fine there, you can see the title of my presentation this uh, evening. It's a somewhat provocative title, but hopefully moving forward, it'll be uh, somewhat clear why I chose that title. Before I begin, I also want to give uh, appropriate credit to my co-authors on this project. This, I'm going to present uh, just a few results from a project I began with my uh, graduate students over the last several months, Sydney Carr, Camry Hudgens, and uh, Zoe Walker. Um, so we've got um, some interesting results, we believe, that are relevant for this panel. And I just want to jump into that, and I'm going to try to stick to my 15-minute uh, time limit. OK, um, there's certainly one thing that can be said about the last several months, uh, beginning with the tragic killing of George Floyd. And it is that uh, the, the country and indeed much of the world seems to be undergoing a sort of uh, what some have referred to as a racial reckoning. Um, there have been demonstrations, protests, um, various efforts to address uh, issues of systemic racism, uh, institutional racism, and it's been playing out across the country. Indeed, uh, many would say that it's at least in terms of the numerical participation of uh, folks in the, in the demonstrations, that what we're currently seeing may well be the largest uh, demonstration in American history. Um, and it's also worth noting that one very different thing about the current um, demonstrations that are unfolding is the composition, the racial and ethnic composition of the participants. Now, um, there can be no denying that white Americans are playing a much bigger role than has been the case in previous civil rights demonstrations going back decades or even more. Um, 
I have seen survey data suggesting that um, that uh, African Americans are more likely to participate in the demonstrations than are others. But given the the demographics of the country, whites are participating in sufficient numbers, even though at a lower rate, that they often dominate the folks uh, who are participating. And we've seen this play out in various parts of the country that don't typically have a lot of racial and ethnic diversity. So. This is setting the stage for some of the questions that we hope to grapple with in our project. Um, and it's about the suggestion here of changing attitudes, in particular, changing white racial attitudes. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. I'll just leave it on screen for a few moments. But this is survey data uh, over the last several years uh, that was posted during the height of the George Floyd demonstrations this past summer. And on a number of dimensions, you can see that white, this is uh, for white public opinion here, uh, white support for the proposition that uh, African Americans encounter barriers that are uh, peculiar to the group, or at least uh, barriers that whites don't traditionally encounter in the domain of policing, but in other domains as well. Support for that notion has been increasing uh, over the last several years, perhaps, uh, in part going back to the demonstrations that unfolded in 2014, but for whatever reasons and whatever source we attribute it to, there can be no denying that uh, a larger fraction of white Americans are prepared to, uh, some might say, acknowledge the presence of racial bias uh, in a way that wasn't true even as recently as uh, 10 years ago. So that might seem to be uh, good news, certainly, depending on one's politics, I imagine, but um, what I'll be talking about here in my remaining time is uh, what are the contours and what are the ingredients underlying this change? I don't deny that this change is unfolding, but the question is how far does it go? Um, and that's really the big issue. We don't necessarily have an answer to this question. That is to say, we know that uh, since 2014, when Michael Brown was uh, killed by uh, a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, um, between then and now, the number and the fraction of whites in the mass public who are prepared to attribute police shootings to some systemic problem, as opposed to the, um, the, the failings of individual police officers who may be so-called bad apples, that's changed a lot. Um, but what has not changed, and herein lies the point of our uh, study that I'll be describing here in my brief comments. What seems not to have changed so much is the extent to which whites are prepared to embrace uh, policy changes that are designed to address this newfound uh, acknowledgement of racial bias. Um, in fact, I just saw some uh, polling data uh, coming out in the last uh, week or two about support for defunding uh, the police, which turns out to be very unpopular among both Democrats and Republicans. Um, in any case, I'm, I'm getting off topic here and, and perhaps my uh, fellow panelists will address that issue more directly. So in my remaining comments, I'm not gonna focus so much on policing per se, although I do have some data on that, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, I'm mostly gonna talk about just the, the fundamental notion of uh, racial inequality and what may or may not be responsible and what should or should not be done about it. To build on the point I just made, um, while it's true that there's an increasing perception and acknowledgement of racial bias, whites oppose a, a variety of different things, not just defunding the police, but also removing Confederate names from US military bases. The vast majority of whites oppose that and uh, reparations uh, for African-Americans as a consequence of uh, slavery, but also uh, Jim Crow, which of course ended officially only in 1968. Um, whites oppose that uh, at very high numbers. There's been some slight movement in support, but it's basically support moving from 10% to 15% or something of that sort. So um, I was, uh, and my team of researchers, my co-authors were concerned about and inquisitive about what might be responsible for this apparent disconnect. That is to say, recognition of racial bias, but unwillingness to make uh, policy changes that address that bias. What could be responsible? Um, we thought that maybe 
uh, it's the case that whites don't recognize the, some whites, maybe many whites don't recognize the magnitude of the racial inequity uh, in this country. Indeed, the response to the George Floyd killing suggests some basis for this perception. Um, everyone who saw the video or even those who just read about it uh, regarded it, of course, as a horrific experience. But uh, for many uh, African Americans, and perhaps my, pan my fellow panelists will talk about this, it certainly wasn't surprising. Uh, but for many Americans, it was surprising as a consequence of exposure to this information uh, some changing of public opinion has unfolded. So perhaps we need more facts. We need to present more facts to Americans and perhaps this will have some impact on public opinion. This is the proposition we uh, test in this project. We refer to this project uh, almost tongue in cheek as the Black Truth Project. What happens if we expose people to information, objective, unassailable uh, information about the nature of racial inequality in this country how might that um, perhaps influence public opinion and perhaps support for policies designed to address this inequity? So we designed a study uh, in particular with this in mind, with the idea being that it's not enough to get people to acknowledge the problem. We want to see what can be done to encourage them to support solutions that will address the problem, because otherwise it's, not, it's a hollow victory. We were especially concerned and interested in whether Democrats or liberals, uh, whites in this case, who are often opposed to many of the very things I talked about on the previous slides, uh, that is to say, neither white Democrats nor white liberals are primarily supportive of uh, reparations, for example. Indeed, in many cases, they're not supportive of affirmative action. So perhaps that's because they just don't appreciate uh, the situation. And perhaps if we were uh, to inform them, uh, then it's conceivable that these attitudes might change. So we filled it uh, an experiment to get at this in the summer of this year uh, during the height of the protests. And we thought this would be a conservative test in some respects because uh, this was a, a particular moment in American history when people were especially attentive to and perhaps uh, responsive to concerns about racial inequity. So if we couldn't move people at this moment, then uh, it's hard to envision a, a, a scenario where they perhaps could be moved. Uh, and before I move further, I also want to give a shout out to two of the undergraduates who worked on the project, Hannah Craig and Chelsea Waddle. Hannah was a former uh, U of M undergraduate who just recently graduated. She's been instrumental on the project, is kind of my lead research assistant. And Chelsea Waddle was an SROP, a Summer Research Opportunity Program student from Jackson State who came and worked on the project this summer and has stayed with it even though she's uh, gone back to classes. All right, so a little bit about the data. I'll talk a little bit about some of the results and then I'll conclude. Um, what we did is we ran an online experiment uh, using a non-representative sample uh, drawn from uh, a, a variant of MTurk, which is known as Cloud Research. It's a non-representative sample, but it actually meets some benchmarks when it comes to partisan representation and uh, ideology and various other things. So it's a diverse sample. Uh, we have almost a thousand whites who participated. We also ran African Americans in the study, but for time purposes, I'm not going to get a chance to talk about that, so I'll just gloss over that point. And we did a simple experiment. Unlike any experiment I've run throughout my career, where traditionally there's some element of deception we inform people about something that isn't quite accurate to see how that might influence their public opinion. But on this study, given that it's the Black Truth Project, we simply inform them about uh, objective reality based on the best available information. Um, in the control group, we simply inform the participants in the study about the definition of the racial wealth gap. Uh, that is to say, um, if one group, uh, one racially defined group has less wealth, assets minus debt, uh, compared to another group, then there, the discrepancy is referred to as the racial wealth gap. It's a little bit more elegant than what I just said there on the fly, but it's a pretty brief description. And that's what every respondent in the study is provided with. But in our two treatment groups, which I'll touch on in a moment, we provide them not merely with this description or this definition, we also provide them with information about the current 
racial wealth gap in the United States. Um, in the control group, again, they just get the definition. It's about 300 some odd people. In the first of the two treatment groups uh, to which the participants were randomly assigned, we uh, referred to one as simply the black disadvantaged group and the other is the white advantage. Uh, and I'll show you those in a moment. They're relatively brief. In both cases, a simple framing experiment. We provide them with information about the objective racial wealth gap between blacks and whites. And what we're gonna be uh, changing is simply the title of the figure that accompanies this information. Uh, in one case, we highlight black advantage, or excuse me, black disadvantage. And in the other, we highlight white advantage. So uh, as you can see here, and again, this information is completely factual based on the most recent data, I believe from 2017, uh, drawn from the uh, federal government. Uh, as you can see, there's a pretty sizable discrepancy there. In effect, there's a 10 to one ratio in terms of the wealth possessed by the average or the median white family relative to the median black family. It is a, it is a sizable discrepancy. And here we highlight the significant disadvantage that African-Americans face when it comes to the issue of wealth. I'm gonna show you the next slide, which is gonna look uh, strikingly familiar because it's gonna be the same information, except the title accompanying the information will be slightly different. Instead of the significant disadvantage of blacks, it's the significant advantage of whites. And again, uh, so a third of our sample saw this, a third of the sample saw the previous slide, and then another randomly selected third was simply provided information about the racial wealth gap, about the definition. So uh, we wanted to see whether exposure to this information actually affected the perception of the size of this gap. And we had a simple question, the one you see here on screen, about uh, whether or not uh, the, the aim here is to compare the, the folks in the treatment groups who see the figure with the individuals who were randomly assigned to the control group who did not get provided any information. Uh, because of the size of the discrepancy, we would expect there to be a greater propensity to uh, identify the size of the racial wealth gap as large, perhaps very, or even extremely large. And uh, for the most part, that's what we found. So in the control group, we've uh, coded everything onto a zero one scale here. So uh, values in the middle at about, about 0.5 suggest a moderate sized racial wealth gap. And in the, uh, in the condition where they're not provided information, uh, whites in the study thought that the wealth gap was moderately large, not, not extremely large, but not uh, very small either. So kind of moderately large. The real issue is whether or not they are more inclined to see a racial wealth gap in the treatment groups? And the answer is they are. Um, the change here is not trivial, it's statistically significant. Uh, it works in the direction you would anticipate, in the direction of the truth, in fact. So when people are exposed to information, on average, they're more inclined to accept the reality, which is that there is, in fact, a sizable racial wealth gap. It is worth noting that the movement here is not as overwhelming as perhaps it could be. Um, in effect, what's going on is there's movement from moderately large in the control group to somewhere between uh, moderately large and very large in the treatment groups. Um, again, the gap is, uh, I think it's fair to say, very large, maybe even extremely large. Uh, they don't actually get there on average, but they are moving in that direction. All right, so that's good news. The treatments seem to work. Um, and it's worth noting that the treatments don't just work for a small subsample of the population. They seem to work across the board uh, with respect to partisanship, ideology, gender, education, uh, levels of political knowledge. Uh, it seems to work in terms of boosting uh, recognition of the magnitude of the, of the um, racial wealth gap. That seems to be true across the board. It's, it's true, of course, I should say, I, I wanna be clear, that you would expect Democrats to be more inclined to perceive a racial wealth gap than Republicans and liberals more so than conservatives, and that is true. The point of this slide is simply to say that the slope or the change across control conditions into treatment uh, uh, groups is about the same for uh, all of these groups. But the real question is, and this is where we're going, it's just a few more slides and I'll conclude, uh, 
uh, does learning about the racial wealth gap change racial attitudes and policy views? Not merely acknowledgement of the problem, but a uh, belief that there are steps that should be taken to address the problem. And in order to assess this, we had the question you see here on screen, I'll leave it on for a moment or two, but essentially we were interested in uh, whether or not participants in the study thought it were important that the government take steps to reduce this uh, fairly sizable racial wealth gap and how important it was for them that these steps be taken. So if things are working the way we would hope that they would work, then we would find a uh, more embrace of these uh, progressive uh, efforts. But in fact, what we find is not much change. Um, so there is a recognition of the magnitude of the problem, but there isn't much embracing of efforts to solve the problem. Uh, again, the substantive meaning of these numbers you see here on screen are essentially um, a posture of about somewhat important, somewhere between somewhat important and very important. But the real point here is there's no change across conditions. So yes, there is greater recognition of the problem. No, there is not greater support for efforts to resolve the problem. Uh, and last slide here, uh, just to sum up, uh, the subjects in our experiment did in fact learn something on average about the magnitude of the racial wealth gap. It, they learned that it was larger than they thought that it would be. And um, that's good because it is much larger than most Americans think it is. It's, it's quite large. It's actually been getting larger over time and it's uh, fairly persistent. What it did not do, however, is alter policy attitudes on race. I've only talked about one outcome variable given my time uh, concerns in this presentation, but we also looked at affirmative action, we looked at reparations, we looked at a range of issues, and for the most part, we don't find any differences uh, that emerge. And this would include for Democrats and liberals and various other folks, uh, however you define them. There's some modest indication on some, in some cases that we get some movement which I can talk about in Q&A if you're interested. But the basic takeaway is that it does not seem to, to matter. Um, so what does this mean? Well, is education the solution here? Um, I don't wanna be too uh, pessimistic. It's possible that more information is required. Indeed, we're envisioning a second experiment, which I can also talk about in Q&A, where we provide even more information, such as that the size of the racial wealth gap um, it, or, or actually, to be more honest, we, we want to provide them with the information you've already seen, but we also want to give them more information, showing them that uh, white, on average, white high school dropouts have more wealth than blacks who have graduated from college. We want to present them with that information to, uh, to undermine any belief that, well, if blacks could just work harder and get an education, they too could have wealth. But in fact, that's not the case we need some sense of uh, some kind of policy intervention in order to address this longstanding problem. And I will conclude on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. Shay, you're on. Great, thank you. Hold on, let me get things pulled up. Just a second. Uh, I wanna also just preemptively say that I am uh, conversing in from Mexico. So my connection is a little bit slower. So we've known that, realized that my slides may change after I've already moved on to talking about the next slide. So I'm gonna try to slow down and time things right so that they appear correctly for you. But um, I wanna apologize in advance in case, just in case they might not. Um, so my research looks at when do, when do we see protests following police killings? So this summer was completely, directly, exactly what I study. Um, so I wanted to take this time to kind of talk through the 2020 protests that we saw around police brutality and kind of answer the question that I've been asked a lot about why now? So as Vince mentioned during his talk, we've seen this huge, we saw this huge surge in protest over the summer. So between the end of May, when George Floyd was killed by police, and the end of August, um, 
it's estimated that there were almost 8,000 individual protest events across the country. And when I say across the country, I really do mean across the entire country. So hopefully the map has now shown up, but there'll be a map if it's not there yet, of over, there are over 2,200 cities, towns, hamlets, all across all 50 states, witnessed protests during this time period. And, you know, I'm sure you saw these things, saw these events on the news and I just want to maybe put some information out there that might counter what possible perception which is that according to the best data we have about what happened during these events 93 percent of this over of this nearly 8,000 93 percent of these protests were peaceful so we had this mass uprising all across the country that was peaceful in response to a police killing and one question that I got asked a lot by journalists um, who were trying to write pieces to understand what was happening, which is why did one death, one death of George Floyd spark so much reaction? And the answer that I tried to convey to, um, to people who I talked to was that this wasn't, isn't just about one death. This is about accumulation of deaths over many, many years, and a movement that has built up to respond to them. And so the reason that we saw these protests was really a culmination of a lot of movement building that has been going on for years. And when I say movement building, I actually, in reality, there are actually two movements that are simultaneously going on. So we have the movement for Black Lives, but we also have a movement for a police accountability, and they overlap quite a bit. So the, the events that we see that lead to protests, that's where you know we have um, issues that affect the the life, you know, the quality and the existence of Black life, overlapping with issues of police violence and police accountability. Both of these movements were started really in response to real deadly and existential threats. So one is that, you know, you know, racism is deadly. We've seen this in 2020 play out with racial disparities for COVID-19, but also um, in response to vigilante killings of African-Americans. So Black Lives Matter really started as a hashtag and as um, the kind of the seed of an organization and of a movement following the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin, who was, if you might remember, was a a teenager in Florida who was killed by a neighbor while walking home from a convenience store. The police are also deadly. So the police accountability side is also responding to a deadly threat. So over a thousand people are killed by police every year. And if you look at this map, that hopefully will show up by now, look at this map on the left-hand side. This is a map, all those yellow squares represent somebody who was killed by police just in 2015. So if you think back to the map of people who were killed, uh, of the protests that we saw this summer, this is just 2015. So really, in all of those places that we saw, there have likely been, and I can tell you, there's a high probability that there has been a police killing in those localities or near there some point in the last, for sure in the last decade. So there is, it means about three people are killed by police per day. And this is much, much higher rate than really any other developed nation. So about five times more than Canada and almost a hundred times more than the UK. And if you think about that Venn diagram of the two movements together, at that intersection, things get really deadly. So when you have racial disparities and policing. So African-Americans are nearly three times as likely to be killed per capita given their share of the United States population. And so when we, these two movements kind of come together, we see at the, at the center we have the issues that affect, policing issues that affect black people. And I will say that really any policing issue is an issue that affects black people because black people have, have a lot of exposure to the police and to police violence. But there's also a lot of other issues that aren't necessarily on the picket, you know, in the protests that organizers are doing a great deal of work to deal with. So this really has to do with the movement is really 
known by organizers as the movement for black lives and really everything that affects black life. So this has to do with education, economic inequality, housing, all of these things. So what's really happened is we see is mo the thing that we see the most is this is at the center of this Venn diagram. And that's really what sparks the protest. And because because of the all this work that the organizers that are doing around issues related to black life, it means that most of the protests that we see after police killings tend to be as a result of Af deaths of African Americans. And I see this really play out in my data. So I collected lots of data from 2015 and 2016, looking at you know, who was killed by police and also which deaths resulted in protest. So if you can see these two graphs, so, white, so blue represents whites who were killed by police, orange represents blacks who were killed by police, and green represents Latinos who were killed by police. So on the left, we see that there are a, fair, a large number of whites who are killed by police. Um, granted, per cap, at a per capita rate, African Americans are killed at a higher rate, but there's, there is a, there's a lot of representation. There's a lot of, of non-Black Lives Matter, non-Black life overlap in the police accountability space. There's a lot of police is, policing issues that, talk, that touch on people who are not Black. But on the right, we see the rate of protests. So overall, 15% of people who were killed, uh, of police killings in that year. So 20, of, of the 2,200, 15% led to some form of local organizing. But for African-Americans, it was over a third, it was about 36%, which is seven times higher rate than that for whites. So if we think about the disparities in policing, this disparity carries forward also into the response and into the police accountability movement. So, you know, again, three times as likely to be killed, but seven times as likely for those deaths to lead to mobilization. And so what, what's really happened in a sense is that one movement is carrying both. So the movement for Black Lives is carrying both all the issues related to Black life, but also through when and every single time someone has killed and every single time that these local org this local organizing takes place also shouldering the whole issue of police accountability. And so who is doing this shouldering? Um, I did want to highlight here the, the move, um, protests that happened. Um, Ann Arbor was heavily involved in the Washtenaw County, was heavily involved. So here's an image of protests that occurred um, on campus um, here at University of Michigan. And there's also an organizer that I think helps illustrate really the ways that all of this movement work is happening and the ways that it really translated this summer. So if you can, hopefully this has appeared by now, but the woman, the picture of the woman on the right, her name is Trisha Duckworth. So she um, lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan, so right next door to Ann Arbor, um, right in the university, you know, backyard. She started an organization called Survivor Speaks, and I think that really it illustrates all of the ways that this organizing has really taken root and taken hold. So her, her organization started off as a um, su support group for survivors of sexual assault. It then developed to, um, into community aid. So COVID-19 relief is particularly recently for people who were most vulnerable and most affected, making sure that they had the things that they need. And it's from that organizing and from that communing with the, with the, um, with the you know, really getting in depth with the community, that when police accountability issues arose, she was able to mobilize a huge number of people. So at the same week that George Floyd was killed, um, right at the border of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, um, Washtenaw County Sheriff's um, deputy repeatedly punched a woman in the head who was, um, when they were responding to something going on, several doors down from her. And in response, she organized these protests. So again, the, the forward face, she was doing all of the work of supporting Black Life, but the, fo the forward face of the protests related to police accountability. And she was actually able to stage a number of um, protests, protests here. And um, I think the largest one reached over, um, had over a thousand participants. 
So I think the culmination of this movement that has been building, opportunities that COVID-19 uh, provided both in terms of getting organizers more directly contact with people, but also the availability for protest. Really, I think all of that together kind of answers the why now. Why did this particular killing, why did George Floyd's death lead to this mass amount of um, political mobilization? And I think it really comes down to the fact that local organizers, for all of those police killings that we've seen, um, any time that there was a death, there was local people like Trisha who were the ones who were organizing demonstrations, organizing movements in in localities. Maybe that didn't get to national, didn't get to the national headlines, but all of the work across all of these localities led there to the capacity to organize at a really at a moment's notice in response to this death all across the country. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't a spontaneous. Um, reaction. It was really the fruition of years and years of building mobilization capacity by all these local organizers. So I'm happy to answer other questions about what happened this summer in Q&A and I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Shay. Okay, our next speaker is Christian Davenport. Thank you, Ken. Let me go through my share as well. Um, thank you very much for um, for coming this evening, and um, it's nice to actually have some interaction with my colleagues. So you've actually given us a an amazing excuse to interact because we haven't really been interacting much. Um, I titled my um, presentation today, Beyond Two Nations. Uh, Andrew Hacker had a book called um, Two Nations back in the day, which talked about um, kind of the divisions that existed within America. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, for eight minutes, 46 seconds, we had a police officer put their knee on an individual and, and squeeze the life out of them. For, out of, respect to the audience, I, I, I blurred this out. What's interesting about um, this topic is, is actually uh, the three of us are kind of coming at it in very different ways, but we overlap in many ways as well. Um, what's distinctive about the, the violent act against George Floyd was that it seemed as if uniformly individuals were um, saying that that's, that's not acceptable. That's, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to tolerate. And we saw that um, emerge in the, um, the protest that stepped forward. What's interesting is um, the police are kind of well aware of this. There's a force continuum scale that most police departments in the United States have. Um, on the left-hand side will be things that um, ordinary civilians can do. And on the right-hand side are things that police do. This, this one came from 78. I'll show you a couple of others. Um, but depending upon how you want to characterize George Floyd, either as completely compliant because he was on the ground handcuffed or passive resistance, deadly force you can see is a huge escalation off of that. Um, another one, kind of like uh, resistance, uh, that's the civilians, that would be regular people. No resistance or a one, uh, these are categories one through six. Uh, deadly force and police officer number 14, again, a huge disparity, right? Um, and the logic of these force continuums is basically, it's kind of like, these are the things that um, given what the subject or the civilian does, these are the things that are believed to be acceptable for the police to do. So again, it's a, a huge disparity. Um, I, I, they, this isn't even close to the most complex or most interesting one, um, but same point, right? You have um, officers' perception of their acknowledging that the officer's perception is incredibly important. Um, mere presence, verbal resistance, resistant passive. Um, so however you wanna classify um, Floyd, uh, deadly force, again, is, is the one that's used. And so my, my point in, in identifying this is, I think one of the reasons why so many people are willing to step forward is because of this discrepancy in tactics of what were being applied in this individual civilian police interaction. It's much less clear in the context of collective behavior, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'd argue that, uh, well, there is no force continuum um, um, spectrum or graphical analysis or much discussion about what the police 
can legitimately and acceptably do against what protesters are engaging in. Uh, here we have an instance of pepper spray where we might kind of be a little bit, um, that might be a little bit much. Just kind of walking up into a crowd and grabbing somebody and arresting them. I think this is in Chicago. Um, we, could, we could admit that, okay, this is probably pushing it a little bit more and we can go in very different directions. I could, I could show you someone just getting hit in the head with a nightstick or some, some brother giving another one a pound. I mean, like there is amazing variation of what we're seeing in the street. And in many respects, my, my question really comes down to what will Americans accept regarding what governments in general and police in particular can do to protesters and correspondingly, what will Americans accept regarding what protesters could do against police? And does, do these vary by race and ethnicity? Um, so why important? Um, we can think many things as to, um, as, as time progresses and as we're thinking about what's gonna take place within this country over the next few months, but there's definitely gonna be more protest and there's guarantee gonna be more protest policing. So, we need to understand exactly kind of what's going on and why people feel the way that they do because um, as I'm gonna argue in a few seconds, this has very big implications for a lot of different things. Um, most importantly, inappropriate behavior, and that is behavior that I'm identifying as kind of off this diagonal, the things that are believed to be completely um, disproportionate to one another on either side will prompt a reaction from opponents as well as the viewing audience, electoral and otherwise. And we can't fix any of this until we figure out exactly what's going on and this is part of the issue, I think. Um, normally we view kind of contentious politics, unconventional, non-traditional behavior, um, where there's a resort potentially to coercion or force is examined distinctly from conventional politics, but we are, we are, in, we are in the interstices of exactly the point at which these two things should be evaluated together because they are intricately connected as we will, as we will see, I believe. And so uh, many believe that there are two nations and that our perceptions um, simplified for the moment of this presentation, black and white are revocably divided. But is this true? So this is, this is kind of my question. What, what do people believe is undermining kind of like, um, or underlying many of these uh, activities? And I'd like to argue that um, Till, um, Charles Tilly introduced this idea of a repertoire and a repertoire is basically anything and everything that could possibly be done. So Tilly identified that in any moment, we draw from a repertoire, but we don't draw from the full repertoire because not all those things are believed to be just, right, and appropriate. So this kind of narrows down the range of things that we would think would be drawn upon. And so if you array all tactics, I just identified four here for simplicity, simplicity's sake, but if you just array all tactics, I'm actually arguing that someone has in their mind an idea of how these fit on a particular scale. And from that, some would be deemed to be unacceptable and some would be acceptable. Well, Tilly was just focused on challenging behavior. I actually argue that this applies to both challengers and governments as they go at one another in a confrontational manner. And so in this context, imagine a challenger engages in tactic one, and we could say that's a sit in or a march. Um, so in, in one of these scenarios, actually my colleagues are blocking my view, in scenario one, in scenario one, the response of the government to the challenger are deemed to be more or less proportional to one another, two and three, in which case no one gets upset. We're just like, okay, that makes sense given what was going on. Alternatively, scenario two, tactics four and five are applied. So to this march or sit-in, the police just roll up and shoot people in the head with rubber bullets or torture them. And folks would be like, whoa, that's completely unacceptable. And that has implications for um, my particular argument. Now, this particular piece I'm gonna talk about, um, which is some work that's shared with um, David Armstrong at University of Western Ontario and Thomas Zaitsoff at American University. It's kind of like, well, what is the scale? And are there differences across um, communities or subpopulations? Well, we argue that the scale is intensity or severity, and we purposely kept this somewhat vague. We could have gone to violent, we could have gone through a bunch of different characterizations, but we went with intensity or severity and allowed individuals to kind of like interpret that as they saw fit. We drew, we drew upon that information. And we believe differences exist across communities based on the community perception of the benefits offered from each side. So um, policing. So um, we believe that, that African-Americans have a particular attitude towards policing. They're not necessarily um, in, in favor of it in all contexts and that they've benefited tremendously from a lot of movement activity. And, and thus their predisposition towards movements is gonna to be higher. With regards to whites, however, we believe that they're 
it's despite the historical connection with the anti-war movement and the labor movement, that the general story or general association that whites have with movements is a little bit less favorable and they might favor police a little bit more. Um, nationally representative sample of this survey um, where we went over African Americans and, and um, mostly whites. We do get some others, but um, mostly whites. Um, but let me actually jump to the punchline in many respects. What we do is, um, I think I can enlarge this, yes. Um, sorry, I use Prezi so you can do this. Ah. Okay. Um, along the, along the left-hand side, you have tactics that um, um, protesters can use. And along the bottom, you have um, tactics that police can use. And so effectively, what we asked in the surveys, we asked individuals to compare an individual tactic of the police to an individual tactic of a, of a challenger and asked which was more intense. And then we repeated these pairings across about 504 combinations which then allowed us to determine kind of like what tactics people generally believe to be more or less intense or severe. And so I see your heads moving and, and hopefully that's, that's what everyone's doing because the whole point is that beige strip, that, that grayish strip during the middle, that identifies the area of proportionality. These are the things that are generally believed to be proportional to one another. Once you start getting into the darker zone, these are things that are believed to be kind of like off response. So for example, um, if you take circulate petitions, which is uh, the, the bottom most tactic undertaken by challengers, um, kind of any response to that <laughs> by the police is believed, to be, um, uh, is believed to be too much. If you yell insults, however, at a police officer, then using informants or spies to get information is believed to be proportional to that, or imposing a curfew is believed to be proportional to that. This is quite interesting information in many respects because we don't talk about generally the individual tactics. We'll talk about peaceful, non-peaceful, we'll talk about violent, non-violent, but we don't break down exactly what people do and think about exactly what's believed to be a proportional response to that. And so, as I mentioned before, what's interesting for us is this whole issue of, do blacks and whites see these things comparably? Um, we could talk about um, tests and so forth later on, but generally what you see, um, whites, the, the lighter gray color, with regards to challenger activity, almost all of them see them as being more violent than African Americans. And correspondingly, African Americans generally see almost all police behavior as being more intense or severe. There are, there are some interesting exceptions, right? So African Americans are clearly much more likely to see being followed by a police car as much more um, intense or severe than whites and show a large presence, there is some overlap. There's some interesting ones with regards to, to whites that I jumped over. Um, African-Americans see writing a letter, um, uh, writing a critical letter to a, an editor, an op-ed as being way more, um, <laughs> as being way more intense or severe than, than whites. Um, and the tactical discussions in and of itself, I think are, are quite fascinating, but um, given the time, I'll move forward. Um, I really wanted to highlight a couple of things. Black and white Americans do live in slightly different nations, which is very important as we try to understand kind of later what's going on. And effectively, there'll be no change until we understand how opinions diverge as well as converge. Now, how do we live in this divide, especially going into campaigns and election? Now, the police violence directed against the Floyd protest reveals some commonalities about the United States, but it also revealed some interesting variation as some people were supporting the policing efforts enacted by certain types of protest but not others. Now, with blacks favoring protest and whites generally favoring pro policing of protest, how do you understand that? And I was trying to think through the implications of this. So for Democrats, I think the smart play would be to have a moratorium on all black, at, black Lives Matter related protests, diminishing the likelihood of behavior getting out of hand, which of course it always can, with informants or just some people just going wild at, uh, at a particular protest. Republicans would be best served by provoking, subverting, or negatively covering BLM-related protests, showing greater norm violations from their side regarding the appropriate or acceptable behavior. And so there's something about the contestation itself that has implications for how individuals will be subsequently motivated to go one way or the other. Now, what about the longer term? Well, I think we need to understand and explore exactly what does it mean that Blacks will generally perceive as less violent protester activity that whites will see 
as generally being more violent? And will this play out in efforts to highlight threatening Blacks? And what does it mean that whites will generally perceive as less violent police action that Blacks will perceive as more violent? Will this play out to efforts that highlight law and order seeking whites? And this, I think, gets to the core of what many of us need to try to figure out, because essentially whether or not we're actually able to move beyond two nations or not will be intricately connected with our ability to understand these problems and simultaneously to move past them. Thank you. Okay, thank you to my colleagues. Um, very uh, intriguing and overlapping um, uh, presentations. Um, I did have, uh, so I have one question. Uh, some one person raised her, her hand. I'll, I'll, um, I'll see uh, if sh we can. Carlos, do you see um, someone who raised her hand? But anyway, one question that came up uh, immediately uh, from uh, Jack, what can be done to limit the power of police unions? It seems as if they view their mission as making it impossible to hold bad officers responsible for criminal activity. So would any of the three panelists like to address that? Can you raise your hand, panelist, and, or just so I can, if you want to discuss that question. Christian. Um, one, I think, um, um, interestingly enough, Margaret Levy has some great work on police unions that it was largely neglected for long periods of time, and I think she provides some insights into that. What's, what's fascinating in many respects is police unions might be one of the only remaining unions in America that have done well over time. And then the question is, how exactly were they were able to pull that off, whereas most other unions are being kind of like um, subject to other issues. But I think the answer to the question is, in order to contextualize police behavior and police organizations, into a broader sense of broader political equality. What I find interesting is we have very little discussions about civilian oversight, where we have all these other discussions about changing the curriculum, body cameras, and so forth. But uh, we need to get civilians back into the monitoring of police business and even make this as a, a subject of what needs to kind of happen. Of course, we need to educate the citizens on what to do. We need to come up with some independent monitoring. But I think all of this contextualization is necessary to counteract the, um, the power that's been accrued by the unions. Hey, Carlos, you want to let Susan ask her question live? Can you do that? Susan? Susan, can you unmute? Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank okay, you. Great. Um, thank you both. Uh, thank you, all three of you, very much. Um, I have two questions, but the first one is really for Vincent. Um, you sort of conclude that um, maybe the the in the study um, that they don't see that it's necessary necessarily up to the federal government to um, to address these issues of the racial wealth gap, et cetera. But maybe and, and maybe this is already in your um, data set. But maybe they just don't believe that it's the federal government that should have that that should play that role. So um, was that addressed? And then the second question I had was for Christian, um, where you know we talk about. Uh, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the civilian oversight and whatnot. But how do we um, how do we address the one thing that we could do right now is look at the number of the amounts that have been paid out to families of victims who have been injured or killed by by police action and the amount that the cities or um, states are losing in that way um, but it doesn't seem to have an effect on changing the behavior of the police unions so is that one area that we might be able to have an impact on when we see that our state or our city county is paying out you know millions of dollars every year for multiple um, cases thank you so vince you want to start yes i'll i'll be brief that's a great question uh thank you susan it's uh something that occurred to us of course after we had run the study that's often how this uh works but um we're envisioning as i said briefly a follow-up study where we're going to refashion the question or include an additional question that would talk about private entities like corporate America or private charities 
uh, stepping in. It's not, uh, so two quick things, I don't wanna uh, hog the floor here. I'll just say as a practical matter, given the magnitude of the problem, it's not immediately obvious to me how any entity other than the federal government can truly feasibly address this disparity. But even if, but if one does in fact have such a perspective, we intend to pr provide a question that would allow for people who want to solve the problem, but who just don't want to rely on government to do it. So that's number one. So in the future, we're going to do it. And number two, uh, to the extent that that represents the rationale for people resisting an effort to embrace the solution, that should be presumably less true for ideological liberals and Democrats. So it's conceivable that it might be a barrier for Republicans and conservatives, but it's not obvious to me why it should be for Democrats and liberals. And we find uh, for that population, I may have gone over this uh, too quickly for it to be picked up by the audience. But if you only focus on white liberals and Democrats, we find the same effect. It does not. Uh, uh, they are not more inclined to support efforts for government to address this problem, even when we uh, reveal to them that this is a gargantuan uh, chasm in terms of the uh, wealth uh, uh, that the average black family has relative to the average white family. So I don't consequently think that uh, if government and the, and the inclusion of that term in the question scared off some people, it's not obvious to me why it should have scared off liberals and Democrats. They seem perfectly happy with government stepping in in other circumstances. Christian? Great question. Um, Susan, I understand it. What's interesting is, um, I think there's just an article like within the last week or so that talked about um, there's insurance companies that are helping these cities cover the cost. And so just like 2008, someone was banking on the fact that someone couldn't pay their bank loan. There's individuals who are actually making money off of the fact that cities are gonna engage in some um, police impropriety and then there's gonna be some payout. And so maybe the cost structure of that needs to change where like, um, Perhaps uh, the one percent are more directly taxed for such police improprieties, and they would be paying uh, one fifth or or one half or one third of their income. If that were to happen, I think that would maybe um, offset some of these activities, as people would be more fearful of exactly what was going on, and this cost wouldn't be hidden in the way that it is currently. Okay, we have a. Um, <laughs> Someone wants to join, so how was this research funded and do you have needs for future individual support around this important work? Well, as the director of the Center for Political Studies, the answer is absolutely. We have, we, we, we need resources, definitely, definitely for this important work, yes. Um, do any of my colleagues wanna speak to that? What's What's frustrating in many respects, uh, the number of funding organizations that are available is somewhat limited, especially for certain types of topics. And so um, uh, my particular piece came from hustling to basically piece together some things to get it done. And then the explorations that I wanted to continue on, um, you always suffer from a difficulty of trying to frame and pitch your particular topic in line with either what the foundation or individual funder wants. And quite frequently, we have not had the space that we've had um, I think in the past few months for someone to actually pay attention or listen to the research agendas that are emerging from this sheer wealth of questions that need to be raised and the idea that it's there's some rigorous work being done on it as well. I think um, there's a huge moment available for trying to get, garner this type of support. It almost wants you to create like a, you almost want to create a GoFundMe to basically get your stuff done sometimes because you feel that you can more directly pitch it to regular folk as opposed to some of the foundations. So I think that, I think the needs are huge, um, but we need to kind of address that because there's so many, there's so many questions to ask and so many things that need to get done. So other questions people have post them in the Q&A, in the chat. Can I ask this in question? Absolutely. All right, Vince, I was curious, man. So implicit within some of your stuff is kind of like more information might lead to more empathy, but is it also possible it could lead to more anger? Yeah, that's a good question, Christian. We're, 
Um, this, the, the study that I presented here was really what we might call a pilot study. So we're going to do a follow-up work and we're going to try to incorporate anger uh, with the expectation that there'll be a lot of that among perhaps especially African Americans. Um, and of course, the, it's a, the project is motivated in part by a, perhaps a naive uh, or Pollyannish expectation that if we could only, it's the belief you often, you know, if people often say if, if, if they only knew more then people would agree with me. They don't put it that bluntly, but that's what they often mean. And so I thought, let's just put that to the test. Um, I don't want to be knee jerk in my response. I don't want to be overly cynical. It's just one study. And um, the lack of findings could be a consequence of the way we framed it or the information we provided. So that's partly why we want to go back in the field and see if there's more. And I'll just say quickly too, one of the, we did, we had some open-ended responses like, so why do you think there is a racial wealth gap? And a lot of people responded that uh, whites just work harder uh, than blacks or that they are somehow, they value education more. So that's partly why we want to make it harder for people to say that. Um, it may be whites do work harder and maybe whites do value education more, but I suspect they probably don't uh, do this 10 times more than do blacks. And so um, we want to provide information that will dispel that belief. If it, isn't, if it isn't work ethic, if it isn't value of education, then what is it? Thank you. So uh, Carlos is going to uh, prompt uh, Byron. Go ahead, Byron, you're muted. Byron, you're still muted. Can you unmute? Do, do we actually need the majority of the population to actually go along with uh, policies for us to get it done? Because there are a lot of policies, you know, particularly in the civil rights movement that took place without majority consensus. Uh, but my other issue was with respect to the wealth gap. Um, isn't there a need to have more diversity in terms of policy recommendations apart from, uh, say, reparations and affirmative action that could actually narrow the wealth gap? Uh, so by way of example, um, there's $400 billion in assets under management in venture capital in the United States. And women, even though they're the majority of STEM graduates, get about 3% of venture capital and blacks get less than 1% of venture capital. And the Fortune 500 companies, 40% of them, at one point needed venture capital. So if we're only getting less than 1% of venture capital, then we're not going to be the owners of the Amazons or the Googles of tomorrow. So, uh, you know, that could be a way to close the wealth gap in terms of making sure, you know, that our pension dollars, which is primarily going towards, you know, white venture capital firms could actually be funneled into more black venture capital firms. I'm sure the federal government could do that because of that issue. So that could be a way to uh, close the wealth gap. Don't you think we need more variety? Uh, and then the final point is, uh, if we talk about housing as a way to close the wealth gap, uh, there's a study that shows that 80% of Bostonians, Black Bostonians, have um, experienced uh, housing discrimination in terms of trying to rent, because you were talking about two Americas. It's to do with, you know, housing discrimination a lot of times, too. So can't we support legislation whereby governments can actually, the government can actually send undercover agents to these uh, rental agencies or, or stuff like that? And if they do discriminate against black undercover uh, government officials who are posing as renters, that their license could be uh, suspended and th things of that nature. So don't we just need a, a much more variety of 
policies that we could get around to actually uh, narrow the pay gap, uh, essentially, is my question. Uh, sorry, to narrow the wealth gap. Thank you. Excellent points. I'll be brief. We, there's work by economists at uh, Duke University and uh, the New School, among other places. Uh, this will be William Darity and uh, Derek Hamilton and their various colleagues, where they've looked at the wealth gap and the various, uh, they, they have a, a, a paper out that talks about the myths that drive it. There's much to be said here, but I'll again keep this brief. It's um, Although your suggestion is an interesting one, and it certainly would be helpful, part of the aim of the project was to drive home just the magnitude and the depth of the problem. It's quite, uh, it's not the sort of thing that's gonna be resolved with just one solution, not that I think you were implying that. Uh, the solution you put on the table could well uh, contribute to some degree, but it's unlikely to dramatically diminish the, pro the, the problem. That's why I referenced the work of economists, uh, William Darity and, and Derek Hamilton. They show that it's not, it's not about home ownership. Uh, blacks who've graduated from college are less likely to own homes than whites who haven't graduated from high school. It's not about managing your portfolio. It's not about work ethic. It's not about marriage, uh, family structure. None of these things really do the trick. And it's worth noting too that the, what, I dis, what I discussed in my uh, presentation did not actually focus on reparations at all. It just asked whether the federal government should pass laws of any sort, it was, it was actually quite vague, that would address the disparity. That doesn't have to manifest itself as reparations. Uh, it could manifest itself in the solution you put on the table or some other potential solution. But um, I'll just end by saying that there isn't a lot of support among many whites in spite of all that's happened in the last several months, even for such relatively conservative policies as affirmative action. That's a, there is, most whites oppose affirmative action. Most whites oppose affirmative action. Most white Democrats oppose affirmative action. Most white liberals oppose affirmative action. So if they oppose those policies, it's not obvious that they will uh, come on board for other somewhat more uh, far reaching policies. Christian, all right, go ahead. Yeah, I, I very much like the, the sentiment of the question because it asks some stuff that I think is kind of foundational, which we don't really get to, which is, um, you know, how much mobilization is actually necessary to get something done and who precisely needs to get mobilized. Um, like living in DC, I, I, very, I very much and very quickly got a sense of lobbyists, right? So we're familiar, for those of us that read the history of the kind of civil rights movement, we're familiar with people coming in by buses and trains and, and coming in at, you know, and they meet, their, they meet their, their politician for a minute and then they leave. And then the lobbyist resumes their weekly lunch. I mean, there's just certain basic dynamics of how government is, is undertaken, which is interesting. But the, the, um, the, um, the question also makes it seem as if polish, policy should be efficacious as opposed to a belief system. And I think the attachment that certain people have to certain types of policy options that become almost um, something that would be that you believe in them. It's not necessarily they're efficacious. We might not have actually evidence for that, but we believe that they should work. And I think we need to kind of get away from that in many respects. And that's what the, the substantive representation kind of like push was, I think, to kind of get at. Um, but if you think of um, in all of the uh, pieces that I remember reading about um, John Lewis's passing, um, very few of them talked about the detailed evaluation of the policies that he got passed. And that's because much of our understanding of exactly how, how legislation gets made and exactly what's involved in that particular process, I don't think most people understand. So it might be an issue of um, the crisis of imagination with regards to how people think that legislation is, is undertaken and who's needed for that and what types of policies get put forward. So I think that those topics, I think, are definitely worthy of further investigation. Okay, we have a bunch of questions now. I'm gonna try, so if we could keep our answers somewhat brief, um, those are, these, these are great. Um, so uh, there's a question, I'll combine some of these. One question for Vince, have you thought about expanding the study to cover Latinos and Asian Americans? Um, let me hold that question. Um, they, someone else asked when the survey was conducted, if it, if it happened over the summer, did, it, did the responses change as the summer progressed? And then finally, sorry, but I'm bunching them all. They're all for Vince right now. 
Um, would it be possible to incorporate education around the role government has played in contributing to the wealth gap? So there's a lot there, Vince, feel free to, uh, those are just three of about uh, seven or eight new questions. So quickly, yes, the uh, Latinos on average have about as little wealth, uh, the median family wealth for Hispanic families is uh, roughly the same as it is for African Americans. Um, so um, we haven't thought about incorporating it, but presumably we would get comparable results. But for now, we're still trying to just get proof of concept with respect to focusing on African Americans. It's slightly, the disparity is slightly larger with African Americans relative to whites uh, in the case, uh, compared to whites, compared to Hispanics, but it's about the same. With Asian Americans, it's, it's a little more complicated. Prior to the 08 uh, crash, uh, Asian Americans on average families, their families had more wealth than whites, but after the 08 crash, they were hit pretty hard, and so they lost wealth. Uh, we haven't incorporated that either, because again, this is a very early project. Um, and uh, Ken asked a couple of other questions, which I'm, I'm afraid I can't remember right now. Well, what role did the government play in, in creating the wealth gap? The government is uh, intricately and intimately involved in creating the wealth gap uh, because the wealth gap uh, in part dates back obviously to reconstruction times, but also to more recent times within certainly my lifetime and maybe some of the lifetime of the people in the audience uh, with Jim Crow, uh, you know, uh, um, racial bias in, in lending, redlining, uh, racial covenants, all these things uh, which were technically made illegal in the late 60s, early 70s, but which continue on, either the government actively promoted or turned a blind eye to. So the government isn't an innocent bystander here. The government, along with major institutions like banking and lending uh, organizations, is uh, directly responsible for the racial wealth gap. Okay, I wanna ask a question to all of them, even though it was directed at Vince, I'd like to have you all think about this. I think it's a great question. One person asks, and it's, it's related to what Vince was saying, but it's really related to what all three were you were saying as well, um, about alternative versions of facts that get presented to people and the degree to which the two Americas, the different perceptions of the protests, for instance, people in the society just have alternative versions of facts and that's a big root of the problem. Anybody feel free. I, want to I, mean, touch that? I can I can touch that. I mean yes, I mean that, I think that's a huge problem. I mean as we can see with Vince's study, even if giving the facts, like given here's the actual real data, um, the fact that people can still, you know, think about things interpret that differently, you know, even when we're starting from the same facts, we can have different interpretations of, of the magnitude of these problems. And so when we're starting from different facts, which I, I mean, I think if you have social media, you are seeing different facts, most likely than other people in your family, other people you're friends with, maybe even in your own household. And so that, so if you're running across these kind of conflicts. If we have if we have these conflicts of fact, then yes, it is it's going to be even harder, I think, to make headway on these related to racial wealth gap, related to policing, related to any of these issues. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, I think um, it's like thirty five or forty percent of the the American population that believes that the the sun revolves around the earth. I mean, we have some we have some fundamental issues. I mean, so what's political knowledge in many respects if we have something like that, right? And so, it, and we had this model for a long time. If we made people aware of certain things about the world that they could like really understand and grasp, that we could then move to a period of convergence. Okay, that model goes away. Then we have to move to then different models about how we would motivate and mobilize individuals that aren't based on coherence around facts. It has to be coherence around something else. And we need to have a conversation about what those things would be. Uh, many of them are perhaps less stable than um, the earth revolves around the sun. <laughs> and, and if we have a bunch of moving parts like that, and we're then thinking about emotions and marketed, mar marketability, we're back in the world of kind of like propaganda analysis in the 20s and 30s before that fell before that fell away. And I think that's just placing us in a, in a very different environment where facts and education will not set us free. And in fact, we'll just need to better outmarket and understand the temperaments of 
how different things are going to kind of mobilize. And that's just a very different model than I think we've had underlying much of our studies. Okay, um, we have uh, more questions than we can ask uh, or that we can uh, discuss. Uh, and, and they've asked us to, to wrap up in the next minute or two. But we have a great question that I think all three panelists should have at least the opportunity to answer, which is, what is this going to mean for the 2020 election? Your research finding. Um, um, I went to the 2020 elections explicitly. Um, I think that exactly how things play out in the street or perceived to play out in the street has implications for which way you're going. We talked, there was a piece talking about like Biden being the, the, the true law and order president and that Trump was also simultaneously promising to kind of deliver law and order. What is law, what is order is directly relevant to the tactical variation and the response that the other side is going on. I think my comment about the moratorium on BLM activities spoke directly to that because um, the ability to spin the law and order narrative is in part a function of what's taking place in the street. If nothing's taking place in the street and there's a systematic strike and withdrawal from all civil rights activities or all um, human rights activities, if there's nothing to provoke, then that law and order narrative is then gutted and then we can then perhaps move on to other topics. But if there's any people that are coming together on the street, all you need is one person with a bag and an explosive to then turn it into mayhem, or you need some agent provocateur to send them off. And so remember, whenever you have a protest activity, someone from the state is probably represented within that, that particular group. And it's very easy to perturb, but you can't perturb something that's not there. I'll, I'll just answer. I mean, it's an excellent question. And obviously it's on all of our minds given uh, well the events of this past weekend, but also the upcoming election. Um, in my own case, I think that what, what I started out with was at least somewhat more optimistic, again, depending on one's politics, there is clearly and unmistakably movement on the part of white public opinion and, and make no mistake, the vast majority of voters in this country remain non-Hispanic whites. And they are more likely to adopt a view consistent with a, a kind of a Joe Biden version of reality as opposed to a Donald Trump version. That is to say, they recognize the presence of racial barriers, uh, the problems of racial bias, the systemic problems inherent uh, with respect to race. And to the extent that that is true, that works against uh, Trump in the upcoming election. Um, and uh, basically, the, the, the uh, biggest issues in the country with respect to the upcoming election are obviously COVID-19, the economy, which is the worst we've had since the Great Depression, and the racial unrest, which was the subject of each of our conversations this uh, evening. Um, Biden is seen as the more effective uh, polls. All the polls I've seen suggest that Biden is seen as the more effective leader when it comes to issues of race and when it comes to uh, the COVID-19 response. So uh, on the economy, it's more of a wash with Trump having a mild uh, advantage in some polls. So this, all of this suggests that the events on the ground work to the benefit of the Democrat in the upcoming election. But I'll close by saying that it's worth knowing, it's worth noting that this disparity uh, with respect to racial, uh, the racial wealth gap, it's not as if that emerged under the Donald Trump administration. It was present under Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter and I could go on back you know, to George Washington. And so uh, the point here being that it's appropriate to ask what's gonna matter with respect to who's gonna win the election, but it's also appropriate to ask what difference is it gonna make for addressing this racial wealth gap? Shay, do you wanna, do you wanna say anything? Sorry, as if Vince had such a good conclusion, I feel like I'm like gonna like mess up the ending. But um, I will say that I think that I think there's I've been thinking a lot about this. I thought about pulling it into my talk about the fact that you know the protests and especially the focus on what little rioting and looting did occur, like what effect that's gonna have on um, election. But I think what I think what we're seeing right now, from what I can tell. It's kind of a, there's a there's a re, different the the assumption that of of one kind of narrative working in favor of Biden or in favor of Trump might be breaking down. I think we're seeing a, a kind of a new 
coalition or new new emotional packaging happening how people feel the mix of fear or feel the mix of anger in response to these sorts of events and how that's going to mobilize in that at the polls i think that um lots of people are feeling both fear and anger and how that's how that mix is gonna gonna change the way they vote or whether they vote at all i think we've yet to see but thank you Oh, you're muted, Ken. Okay, I'm going to turn things over to Natasha. Ooh. Hi, everyone. Thank you to our attendees for joining, and a big thank you to our presenters for giving us so much food for thought and so much to reflect on, especially as we think about the 2020 election. So that last question was a perfect segue into my announcement. Because it is National Voter Registration Day, I want to remind everyone to register to vote, to confirm your registration if you've already registered to vote, and to make a plan to vote. I've put in the chat a resource that you can use, particularly for our DMV area members, but whether you live in DC, Maryland, Virginia, Michigan, or elsewhere, there is information so you can get the information you need to make sure you are ready to vote in the 2020 general election. There are some key dates on your screen. Those key dates are also found in the resource. There are ways that you can vote from home, you can vote early, or you can vote on election day. I encourage you to vote from home. It is safe, it is easy, and it is effective if you do it early and on time. Yes, there are rumors about the USPS being slow, and what I just recommend is that you take as much time as you can to get your ballot out and sent quickly so that way it can get to your um, polling location on time depending on what state you live in. If you're voting in person, I encourage you to be safe, bring the PPE that you need, and be patient because it might take a while to wait in line to vote. If you have any issues voting in person on election day, some resources that you can call are in that voting guide. Now that you've heard a bit of my spiel, I hope you are encouraged to share your plans to vote with family and friends. You can share this resource with family and friends. And then when you inevitably post on social media that you voted, because if you didn't post your voting picture, did you even vote? You can tag us on UMDC and use the hashtag UMishDCVotes. So that way your friends and family and those who follow you on social media can also see that you voted and they will be encouraged to vote as well. Thank you all. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly here or on social media. And with that, I'll turn things over to David who organized this really powerful event to close things off. Thanks, Natasha. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available on ISR website soon. Um, on screen are selected upcoming events sponsored by the University of Michigan Club of Washington, DC. Uh, we even have events, um, other events during these uh, weeks coming up and events that are tentatively planned uh, for the early part of 2021 as well. Uh, please go to umdc.org and click on view more DC events for details and for all of our events. On that site, there is also a box labeled subscribe to get our weekly emails. Thanks to our distinguished faculty members and with apologies to Edward R. Murrow, good night and good luck. <laughs>